Mr. Director, thank you uh, for appearing before this uh, committee today. You are now recognized for your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Peters, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Paul, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committees. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. A critical part of the Secret Service mission is protecting our nation's current and former government leaders. The attempted assassination of former President Donald J. Trump on Saturday, July 13th, 2024, in Butler, Pennsylvania, was a failure on multiple levels. I join you and all Americans in condemning the horrific assault on former President Trump, Corey Comparator, James Coppenhaver, and David Dutch. And I extend my deepest sympathies to the Comparator family and my sincere wishes for Mr. Copenhaver and Mr. Dutch's continued recovery. Before I begin, though, I want to commend the heroic actions of the men and women of the United States Secret Service on July 13th. Our special agents shielded the former president with their bodies while shots were still being fired, selflessly willing to make the ultimate sacrifice without hesitation. I am extremely proud of these actions and those taken by the counter sniper team to neutralize the threat that prevented further loss of life. And I applaud the actions of our tactical teams that responded so quickly. I would also like to express my gratitude to our federal, state, and local partners. We rely on these critical relationships which have developed over decades of daily collaboration to secure protective events and conduct criminal investigations. As you're aware, there are multiple ongoing investigations of the attack and the security failures that occurred that day. I pledge my full support to those inquiries so the Secret Service, your committees, and the American people have a thorough and complete understanding of what happened leading up to and during July 13th. I will not wait for the results of those findings to assess where we failed that day. I have taken and will continue to take immediate steps to ensure we do not repeat those failures. Since my appointment as the acting director one week ago, I identified gaps in our security on July 13th and have implemented corrective actions. One of my first actions as acting director was traveling to the Butler Farm Show site to better understand how our protection failed. I went to the roof of the AGR building where the assailant fired shots and I laid in a prone position to evaluate his line of sight. What I saw made me ashamed. As a career law enforcement officer and a 25 year veteran with the Secret Service, I cannot defend why that roof was not better secured. To prevent similar lapses from occurring in the future, I directed our personnel to ensure every event site security plan is thoroughly vetted by multiple experienced supervisors before it is implemented. It is clear to me that other protective enhancements could have strengthened our security at the Butler event. As such, I have directed the expanded use of unmanned aerial systems at protective sites to help detect threats on roofs and other elevated threats. I've also directed resources to facilitate our protective site communications, particularly our communications with our state and local partners. In addition, I have instructed the asset request for Secret Service protective details to be approved expeditiously and have ordered the maximum use of requested personnel at protective sites to address this heightened security environment. I've heard your calls for accountability, and I take them very seriously. And given the magnitude of this failure, the Secret Service's Office of Professional Responsibility is reviewing the actions and decision-making of Secret Service personnel in the lead-up to and on the day of the attack. If this investigation reveals that Secret Service employees violated agency protocols, those employees will be held accountable to our disciplinary process. With respect to congressional investigations and requests for information, I instructed my staff to provide full cooperation and respond expeditiously on a continuing basis to ensure you have the information you need to conduct your critical oversight. In my testimony before you today, I will provide details on the Secret Service's advanced security planning for the Butler Farm Show site. Facts as we know them regarding the incident itself, 
known breakdowns in executing the security plan and corrective actions that the agency is taking to ensure that nothing like this happens again. But I do not believe that inadequate time to plan for this event was a factor in the failure. As you saw in my written statement, I am prepared to provide an overview of the security planning leading up to and during the July 13th attack. However, I would like to point out that based on what I know right now, neither the Secret Service counter sniper teams nor members of the former president's security detail had any knowledge that there was a man on the roof of the AGR building with a firearm. It is my understanding those personnel were not aware the assailant had a firearm until they heard gunshots. Prior to that, they were operating with the knowledge that local law enforcement was working an issue of a suspicious individual prior to the shots being fired. I regret that information was not passed to Congress and the public sooner with greater frequency. And I fear this lack of information has given rise to multiple false and dangerous conspiracy theories about what took place that day. And I want to debunk these theories. Let me address one conspiracy directly. The Secret Service counter sniper neutralized the assailant within seconds after the assailant fired his weapon. That counter sniper had full discretion to use deadly force to stop an attacker and did not need to seek authorization to fire. I am immensely proud of the selfless dedication of our employees to the mission. Every day across the globe, the men and women answer the call to protect our nation's leaders, and the standard is no fail for a reason. During our current high operational tempo, I want and I need to ensure that the Secret Service workforce are uplifted so they can focus on carrying out the mission. They have my full support, and I'm confident in their abilities to ensure the safety and security of the people we protect. They are worthy of trust and confidence, and they deserve your support, as well as the support of the American people. Chairman Peters, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Paul, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committees, thank you for the opportunity to testify at this joint hearing. I will submit the remainder of my statement for the record, and I will answer your questions. Mr. Bate, uh, thank you for appearing before the committee here today. You are recognized for your opening remarks. Thank you, sir. Good morning, uh, Chairman Peters and Durbin, Ranking Members Paul and Graham, and distinguished members of the committee. It is a privilege to appear before you today to discuss the FBI's investigation of the attempted assassination of former President Trump on July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania. Before going further, I want to again offer my and our condolences to the victims of this heinous attack, to the family and loved ones of heroic firefighter and father, Corey Comparator, to Mr. Dutch, to Mr. Coppenhaver, who continue to recover, and to former President Trump, who was also struck by a bullet fired from the shooter's rifle. Our thoughts and prayers are with each of them and their families and loved ones. Within minutes of the attack, the FBI field office in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, received notification of the assassination attempt and responded to the scene immediately with a surge of resources, quickly moving forward on the investigation. From the outset, the FBI has been investigating this attack as an assassination attempt and an act of domestic terrorism. Our team continues to conduct a full, thorough, and objective investigation, and will continue to follow all leads and avenues of investigation to logical conclusion, leaving no stone unturned. While it's not typical to provide details of an ongoing investigation, this, as we all know, is an extraordinarily tragic set of circumstances of the utmost national importance, making it essential to inform the American public and Congress what is known right now with full transparency. The investigation remains focused, of course, on determining motive, identifying any potential co-conspirators or others with knowledge of the attack, and building out a timeline of shooter Thomas Crook's actions in advance of and during the attack. Thus far, though absolutely nothing has been ruled out, the investigation has not identified a motive nor any co-conspirators or others with advanced knowledge. To date, the FBI team has conducted more than 460 interviews, executed search warrants, including at the shooter's residence, 
and seized electronic media to include phones, laptops, hard drives, and thumb drives. Legal process has been issued to dozens of companies, and we've received more than 2,000 tips from the public. The full resources of the FBI have been brought to bear in furtherance of the investigation. Agents, analysts, professional staff, experts. I've personally visited the site of this horrific attack and seen firsthand the work of FBI Pittsburgh and our partners on the front line and want to thank all involved for their ongoing and tireless efforts to get the answers that we need and to deliver justice. Specialized resources deployed included evidence response teams, victim services specialists, laboratory and operational technology division resources to process physical and digital evidence, a shooting reconstruction team. Additionally, our explosive experts have analyzed the three IEDs recovered, two from the shooter's vehicle, one from the family residence. And our behavioral analysis unit, importantly, is helping to build a profile of the shooter to include his mental state. Next, I want to provide a brief highlighted overview of the timeline that has been established to date through witness interviews and other information. Again, this is our understanding at present and is subject to change and further refinement as more facts are collected. On July 3rd, the rally in Butler, Pennsylvania was announced. On July 6th, the shooter registered to attend the rally and performed a search for, quote, how far was Oswald from Kennedy? On July 7th, the shooter traveled from his home to the Butler Farm Show grounds and remained there for approximately 20 minutes. We assess this show's advanced planning and reconnaissance on his part. On July 12th, the shooter traveled from his home to the Clareton Sportsman Club, where he practiced shooting. On the morning of July 13th, at approximately 10 a.m., the shooter returned to the farm show grounds and remained there for about 70 minutes before returning home again. At approximately 1.30 p.m., while at the residence, the shooter's father gave him a rifle for the purpose, he believed, of going back to the sportsman club. About 25 minutes later, the shooter, the shooter purchased ammunition while en route to the Butler Farm Show grounds. The subject then arrived at the scene, was moving around the farm show grounds close to the American uh, Glass Research AGR building from which he ultimately committed the attack. Shortly thereafter, at approximately 3.51 p.m., the shooter flew a drone approximately 200 yards from the farm show grounds for about 11 minutes. The drone and controller were later found in the subject's car. Analysis has not revealed any photos or video taken by the drone, but we can confirm that he was live streaming at the time and would have been able to view, to view it on his controller. The first reported sighting of the shooter by local law enforcement was at approximately 4.26 p.m. At approximately 5.10 p.m., the shooter was again identified by local law enforcement as a suspicious person around the AGR building. And at approximately 5.14 p.m., a local SWAT operator took a photo of the shooter. At about 5.32 p.m., local SWAT observed the shooter next to the AGR building using his phone, browsing news sites, and with a rangefinder. At approximately 5.38 p.m., the photo of the shooter taken earlier was sent to local SWAT operators in a text message group. Subsequently, approximately 25 minutes prior to the shooting, the U.S. Secret Service command post was notified of a suspicious person. Officers lost sight of the subject from approximately 6.02 p.m. to 6.08 p.m., but continued to communicate with each other in an attempt to locate him. Recently discovered video from a local business shows the shooter pulling himself up onto the AGR building rooftop at approximately 6.06 p.m. And at approximately 6.08 p.m., the subject was observed on the roof by local law enforcement. At approximately 6.11 p.m., a local police officer was lifted to the roof by another officer, saw the shooter, and radioed that he was armed with, quote, a long gun. Within approximately the next 30 seconds, the shots were fired. The evidence recovery team found eight shell casings at the scene next to the shooter's body. We believe that the subject, the shooter, fired eight rounds. While the investigation has not determined motive, the investigative team continues to review information from legal returns, including online and social media accounts. Something just very recently uncovered that I want to share is a social media account which is believed to be associated with, this, with the shooter in about the 2019-2020 timeframe. 
there were over 700 comments posted from this account. Some of these comments, if ultimately attributable to the shooter, appear to reflect anti-Semitic and anti-immigration themes to espouse political violence and are described as extreme in nature. While the investigative team is still working to verify this account to determine if it did in fact belong to the shooter, we believe it important to share and note it today, particularly given the general absence of other information to date from social media and other sources of information that reflect on the shooter's potential motive and mindset. These are the facts, in part, that the investigation has revealed to date. While the shooter is dead, our work is very much ongoing and urgent. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any and all questions. Uh, thank you. Let's uh, go back to the resources. Uh, do you need more money? Senator, we listen, there is an, uh, a single branch, a single agency in the executive branch that could, could that needs more money. Uh, everyone would take more resources. We've had a great relationship with the Department of Homeland Security, do the Office of Management and Budget. Do you feel constrained to ask for more resources by anybody? No, sir, we, we don't. Uh, and actually, um, we have an, uh, we've have a great relationship with our appropriators and, and obviously the, the authorizing committees, um, and they have always looked out for the Secret Service. So I would encourage you to think big when it comes to resourcing the department in light of uh, what happened here. Um, the encrypted app. Um, Paul, can you tell us about these apps? Have they been broken into? The guy had some apps that were encrypted? I think we've experienced a, a range of um, returns on this. Some of the uh, applications that he was using online were encrypted in nature. Some of the email accounts Have we that broken the, into them? Uh, we've received returns. There are some that we have not been able to get information back because of their encrypted nature. Is that there any way to true. solve that problem? Sir, Senator, we've talked about this before. Uh, we need a solution that provides lawful access to law enforcement. So you're telling me the guy that took eight shots at the, the president, former president, has apps that we can't get into that may, if you could get into, reveal some Relevant information. That is correct, Senator. So if he were talking to some foreign power, and I'd, I don't think any foreign power would hire this guy, by the way, so I'm not overly worried this was some great plot by the Iranians because they couldn't even think of this. However, there could come a day where the, something like this is very important. How do we solve this problem? Senator, uh, you know, as, as we've been saying, we need a solution that provides lawful access where when we go to so you're a company... telling me, I agree with you, I'm not blaming you. We have encrypted apps of an assassin, who, a murderer, and we can't get into them all these days after. That needs to be fixed, folks. I'm all for privacy, but to a point. What if in the future somebody's using these apps to communicate with a foreign power? I think we need to know these things. We need to know them in real time. So lessons learned is that everything failed. Corrective action seems to me you need more money and more people. Accountability. At the end of the day, how many people do you think will be relieved that are duties, Mr. Rowe, because of this? Senator, I publicly cannot, and I cannot weigh in on that sure. right now, right? It has to be a fair and neutral uh, Absolutely. process. From right? a fair point of view. Would you say this is a major system failure at every turn, and those in charge of the system in question, <clears throat> not only was it embarrassing, they failed? So, Senator, again, if there were policy violations, those individuals will be held accountable, and they will be subject to Just send to us to policies, account. if you could. Uh, yes, sir, Thank we you. will. But they will be held to our table of penalties, which Thank will you. include up to termination. Thank you. Director Rowe, uh, in, uh, in your testimony here today, as well as in your written testimony, uh, you said very, very clearly that you can't defend why that building with, uh, could not, uh, with the shooter on top of it uh, was not better covered. You were very clear. You cannot defend that. So my question to you is, I, my understanding is that there's a detailed uh, site survey that is done prior to an event to identify potential threat points. So 
Talk to me about that site survey. I'm sure you've had a chance to look at it now after action. And how did that site survey get approved when it was so clear that that was a major threat from that building? Thank you, Senator. So it, our Pittsburgh field office did the advance. During that advance, not only were they discussing uh, amongst themselves about mitigating the line of sight, but also they were discussing with other agencies that were supporting it. Uh, our counter snipers met with their counterparts. Uh, the, the team lead and team lead uh, met. They walked the site. They identified the AGR building. Uh, and if I may, Senator, if I could point out something uh, right now, if I may, and we will place this for the record. Uh, but this is uh, the point of view. This is from the second floor of the AGR building. This point of view is the point of view where the counter sniper team locally was posted. The gold arrow indicates where the shooter fired from. Looking left, Why was the assailant not seen? When we were told that building was going to be covered, that there had been a face-to-face -face that afternoon, that our team leads met, this was the view. Let me show you another view, Senator. B. This view is a reenactment by one of my agents laying flat. There is a five inch rise on the middle of that roof. The assailant would have had to present his bore over that to get his shot off. The view underneath reflects the perspective that he would have had. Again, I call your attention back to the first exhibit if they'd have looked left. Give me C. This is what our counter sniper team saw. Shooter, no elbows. You barely make out the crown of his head. Below it, the assailant up prone. And let me just tell you, our counter sniper, this individual, I know him. I consider him a friend. He has covered me operationally in conflict zones. And when I did my time on the president's detail, he exemplifies the courage, the skill, and the ability to respond under great stress in such short time to neutralize the threat and prevent further loss of life. Getting back to your question, Senator, these were discussions that were had between the Pittsburgh field office, the local counterparts, and everyone supporting that visit that day. And that's why when I laid in that position, I could not and I will not and I cannot understand why there was not better coverage or at least somebody looking at that roof line when that's where they were posted. Director Rowe, the, the Secret Service, state and local law enforcement uh, were on multiple communication channels, is my understanding, during that time. And as a result, local law enforcement was only able to call in to a state command center uh, that was then relayed from the Secret Service. Uh, this seemed to be a, a recurring uh, issue in emergency situations uh, that we're finding with the federal government, that there's not a seamless way to communicate, particularly if you're relying on local law enforcement to deal with what was clearly a major, major vulnerability. Uh, local law enforcement in Butler told my staff that, uh, the, that they had no way of communicating directly with the Secret Service. And if I listen to uh, Mr. Bates saying there was about a 30 seconds uh, between when the local law enforcement uh, reported that there was a man on the roof with a gun, uh, 30 seconds, uh, if it's communicated directly to a counter sniper team, would that be enough time to react prior to the firing of those shots? Senator, if we'd had that information, they would have been able to address it more quickly. It appears that that information 
uh, was stuck or siloed in that state and local channel. I will tell you, though, that there were um, uh, our tactical elements did have not only did they have embeds from Butler County ESU with them, uh, but they also had uh, radios on the tactical net. Um, it, it is troubling to me that we did not get that information as quickly as we should have. Uh, we didn't know that there was this incident going on, uh, and the only thing we had was that locals were working an issue at the 3 o'clock, which would have been the former president's right-hand side, which is where the shot came. Nothing about man on the roof, nothing about man with a gun, none of that information ever made it over our net. So that will change? Yes, sir. We are working right now to figure out the interoperability and also make sure that we do have access to those channels, whether through a counterpart system or some other means. For the people in my state that keep asking me, I just don't get how he got on the roof. I know we've gone through great details and a lot of examination. Could you just give a minute on what went wrong and how you think it can be fixed? Because I think it's just going to help to dispel the conspiracy theories. There are some people that think it didn't really happen, which of course is completely ridiculous. It did. There are some people that think all kinds of conspiracies went on uh, within the government, which is also false. But could you just tell them what went wrong so they understand? Yes. No, thank you, Senator. Uh, I thought long and hard about this. I, I think this was a failure of imagination, a failure to imagine that we actually do live in a very dangerous world where people do actually want to do harm to our protectees. I think it was a failure to challenge our own assumptions, the assumptions that we know our partners are going to do everything they can, and they do this every day. But we didn't challenge our own assumptions of, we assume that someone's going to cover that. We assume that there's going to be uniform presence. We didn't challenge that internally during that advance. So moving forward, I've directed that when we're talking to people and we're making requests, we are very specific about what we want. We are providing explicit instructions on exactly what our expectation is and what we need them to do and what we want them to do. That's the only way that we're going to be able to move forward beyond this. And let me just tell you that our state and local law enforcement partners are the best. So this, this belief that somehow they are less than federal law enforcement or they're less than the Secret Service, they're out there patrolling communities every day. They're the ones out there going into hazardous conditions every day. They know their communities. They have the ability to enforce state and local laws. Our advanced agents do not. Right. We need them, and we need them to be partners with us, and I think we need to be very clear to them, and that may have contributed to this situation. So do you, I made public documents that show Secret Service deployed a counter unmanned aerial system operator on July the 13th. According to the Secret Service, the drone system was supposed to be operational at 3 p.m. that day. However, we've been told by Secret Service that because of cellular bandwidth problems, it wasn't operational until about 5.20 of that day. If the system was operational, Secret Service would have had the ability to detect the shooter and his own drone use. Why is the Secret Service dependent upon local cell uh, cellular network? Does the Secret Service have a backup plan in place? Yes, thank you, Senator. And uh, that is something that I briefed in the closed door. Uh, and again, something that has cost me a lot of sleep because of the eventual outcome of the assailant. That what if we had geolocated him because that counter UAS platform had been up? It is something that I have struggled with to understand, and I have no, I have no explanation for it. Okay. It is something that I feel as though we could have perhaps found him. We could have maybe stopped him. Maybe on that particular day, he would have decided this isn't the day to do it because law enforcement just found me flying my drone. People fly drones all the time on the peripheries of our sites. 
and we go out and we talk to them and we ascertain what their intentions are. On this day in particular, because of the connectivity challenge, as you noted, there was a delay and he flew his drone at 351 approximately. So moving forward, we are leveraging resources from the Department of Homeland Security and others to make sure that we have dedicated connectivity so that we're not reliant on public domain, so that we can ensure that whatever assets we have in place, those assets are operational. And that is my commitment to you that we are going to make sure we're going to do that, and that is something we are moving out on. In the one question of looking backward to the event uh, on the 13th, um, uh, Director Abate, can, I, can you just talk a little bit about how did the how did Mr. Crooks, how was he able to get um, an AR-15 onto the roof of that building? Does your investigation illuminate anything um, that we have learned uh, to help to make that point more clear? We don't have definitive evidence yet as to how he got the rifle up there. Uh, based on everything that's been collected thus far, photos, video, uh, eyewitness accounts, uh, we do believe he likely had it in the backpack. Broken uh, down in the backpack? We're, we're still assessing that. Uh, our laboratory has taken, it looked at the rifle itself and measured that against the backpack itself. And if placed in this backpack, it would extend outside. It would have been visible. We don't have anyone who has observed him, who observed him with the backpack, with uh, a rifle st a barrel st or other part of it sticking out of the backpack. Um, but the rifle would not have fit fully into this backpack to be um, concealed and whole. Uh, we have video that was recently found of the shooter uh, walking in a distance uh, from his car just before uh, 6 p.m., about uh, 5.56, uh, I believe. And uh, based on everything we have, we assess that he returned to his vehicle at that time, got the backpack, and then proceeded back to the area and to the AGR building. Uh, and then he's observed, of course, on the roof uh, just, you know, minutes later uh, holding the backpack in front of him. In fact, there's um, dash cam footage uh, from a police vehicle that shows him briefly traversing the roof with the backpack in front of him. Uh, and then it's just minutes after that that he's actually seen by the officer who I described with the rifle uh, on the roof. Uh, it's possible that um, he broke the rifle down, though we don't have conclusive evidence of that, and took it out of the bag on the roof in those moments before and reassembled it there. That's one of the theories we're looking at and working on right now. Thank you um, for that. You take me uh, right, um, Acting Director Roe. Thank you for your years in de uh, of dedicated service and, and jumping in in a hot time. Um, but you take me right to this point of communication. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about the, uh, and even in your written and, and um, uh, verbal testimony, you have talked a lot about the communication and the um, disparate nature. Uh, in which it's happening across the different channels. One sort of foundational question that I have is, are all elements of an event communicated on the same channel? If I lost my kid and I'm at a big rally, are, are local law enforcement talking on the same channel about me losing my kid, that they're talking about a suspicious individual? So when it comes to the locals, um, they likely have some type of common... Uh, common channel that they work off of in a county or, or, or uh, an adjoining municipality. When it comes to um, the Secret Service, we do have various channels for, for various agents uh, and our uniformed division officers working specific uh, aspects of that advance. So it's not possible that um, the delay in communication or the um, losing of the, the thread of, of tracking this individual was sort of lost in the commotion of all of the other communications that could have been or maybe was not, was not was sort of separate from the communication channels that were happening. Senator, I can only speak to the Secret Service sure. uh, lines of communication, and uh, we did not have anything beyond suspicious person that was communicated to us. Last question really quickly, because I'm, I'm out of time, but I, acting director, is the, was there any communication um, with the Secret Service that was talking directly with 
the president's, the former president's detail. That feels like there's been some question by colleagues about why the call wasn't made to delay the event. Help us understand the communication that either was or was not happening directly with the president, former president's detail to make the call um, to delay 10 minutes. When we've all been to these events. They never happen on time. Um, but but the, the, to delay while this was being investigated. So the detail, all they, you know, they were, were operating on their net, which our security room was, was monitoring. Uh, but again, having information of a suspicious individual. There were other calls that day of individuals that came to the attention of law enforcement, of people that needed medical uh, attention. So it really, um, that particular, uh, regarding the assailant, um, that never really rose to a level of, we should, we should not put them out there. Had we known that there was a dangerous individual out there, we would never let a protectee go out on stage. Thank Senator Holy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Director Rowe, can you put your first poster, your first demonstrative back up? Please put A up, please. Let's make sure everybody can see it. This is the photograph, I believe, that you took, your team took of the roof, the AGR roof. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, so from this vantage point, as, as the law enforcement who are in those windows, as they look left, they should be able to see the shooter clearly there on the AGR second floor roof. My question is, why is there not a Secret Service counter sniper on that roof? So, Senator, we're, um, when we post up, our, is, our methodology is to look out, look at things that can see in on our protectees. Uh, so that they can provide that coverage. But wh why is there not a, a Secret Service counter sniper there with clear line of sight? That roof has a clear line of sight to the former president. Why didn't you put a Secret Service counter sniper there? Uh, the Secret Service's counter sniper role is to neutralize those threats that are looking in on us uh, from where the protectee is, not necessarily uh, You think maybe position. you might want to revise that protocol in light of what happened here? Uh, they were protecting the principal, and I think in the principal the, got shot. I understand that, sir. So, do you and, think you might want to revise the protocol? Let me ask you this: Who was the lead site agent who made the decision to leave the AGR building completely outside of the security perimeter? Who was that, Senator? I cannot give you that name. This person is operational. They're still doing investigations. They're still doing protective visits. Have they been relieved of duty? Senator, uh, they have not I know been relieved name, of duty. By the way. Why have they not been relieved of duty? They are still cooperating, not only being interviewed by the FBI, but also by our Office of Professional Responsibility. And uh, we will let the facts of uh, the mission assurance and any further investigations play out. Is it, isn't the fact that a former president was shot, that a good American is dead, that other Americans were critically wounded, isn't that enough mission failure for you to say that the person who decided that that building should not be in the security perimeter, probably ought to be stepped down. Senator, I think you're using the word decided, and I think we need to allow the, the investigation play out to include... No, who, okay, so who did, who, who did make the decision then? If it wasn't the lead uh, site agent, who made the decision not to put that in the security perimeter? Senator, you're zeroing in on one particular agent. I want to find out exactly yeah. what was the entire decision process. So I think yeah. I want to be neutral and make sure that we get to the bottom of it and interview everybody in order to determine if there was more than one person who perhaps exercised bad judgment. Well, sure. My question is, why don't you relieve everybody of duty who made bad judgment? So, yeah, you're right. I am zeroing in on somebody. I'm trying to find somebody who's accountable here. And we so will... you're telling me that the person who made the decision not to include this in the perimeter has not been relieved of duty. What about the person who's in charge of the interoperability of radio frequencies between local law enforcement and, and Secret Service? Has that person been relieved of duty? Uh, no, Senator, because interoperability is a challenge, uh, is a greater challenge than just one person. On that day, we had a counterpart system uh, it failed As the person who decided, who made the decision to send Donald Trump onto stage knowing that you had a security situation, has that person been relieved of duty? No, sir, they haven't. Because... As the person who decided not to pull the former president off of stage when you knew that, in your words, the locals were working a serious security situation, has that person been relieved of duty? Uh, no, sir. Again, I refer you back to my original answer that we are investigating this through a mission assurance 
And as opposed to zeroing in on one, what more do you need to investigate to, to know? Exactly what what the more do you need to investigate was? to know that there were critical enough failures that some individuals ought to be held accountable? I mean, what more do you need to know? What I need to know is exactly what happened, and I need my investigators to do their job. And I cannot. A lot of people didn't do I their cannot jobs. put my thumb on the scale. Otherwise, what do you mean? Put your thumb the on the objective. Scale? The obje you're asking me, Senator, to completely make a rush to judgment about somebody failing. I acknowledge this was a failure of the Is Secret it not Service. prima facie that somebody has failed? A former president was sir, shot. Sir, this could have been our Texas School Book Depository. I have lost sleep over that for the last 17 days, been just like you have. Somebody to and hold I will tell you, Senator, I will tell you, Senator, that I will not rush to judgment, that people will be held accountable, and I will do so with integrity and not rush to judgment and put people I can't unfairly believe that you persecuted. Are, I, unfairly persecuted. Unfairly, got people sir, who are we dead. have to be able to have a proper investigation into this, Senator. You said earlier that you've got to make sure that your protocols are followed, and unless there's a protocol violation, people wouldn't be disciplined. I would just say to you, I don't really care that much about your protocols. I think if your protocols don't provide for the fact that when a former president is shot, when an American is killed, when other rally goers, innocent people who just showed up on the day when they are shot at and critically wounded, if that isn't a protocol violation, prima facie, you should revise your protocols. Senator, I think this is where you and I agree. This was a failure and we will get to the bottom of it. Well, I hope you're gonna do something about it. Let Mr. Rowe, thank you for being here. I agree with what you said at the outset that the individual Secret Service agents demonstrated remarkable personal courage, putting their bodies in between the line of sight of the shooter and the president. That being said, the bravery of the line agents is quite different from the decisions of Secret Service leadership. Secret Service leadership committed catastrophic security failures. Indeed, the worst security failures for the, for the Secret Service since 1981, since the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan. It is incumbent upon this committee to determine why those security failures happened. Just after the shooting, Secret Service put out an official statement from your spokesperson that says there's an untrue assertion that a member of the former president's team requested additional security resources and that those were rebuffed. This is absolutely false. In fact, we added protective resources and technology and capabilities as part of the increased campaign travel tempo. Was this tweet accurate? With respect to Butler, Pennsylvania, it is accurate, sir. It is accurate that the Trump team had not asked for additional security and had not been rebuffed. If you're talking about Butler, Pennsylvania, all assets requested were approved. If you're talking about the media reporting of assets requested, uh, there were times when assets were uh, unavailable and not able to be filled, and those gaps were staffed with state and local law enforcement tactical assets. So I, I'm reading from the Washington Post, July 20th, 2024. Secret Service said to have denied requests for more security at Trump events. The opening paragraph, top officials of the U.S. Secret Service repeatedly denied requests for additional resources and personnel sought by Donald Trump's security detail in the two years leading up to his attempted assassination, uh, according to four people familiar with the requests. Is that right, that repeatedly the Trump detail asked for more resources and repeatedly Secret Service leadership turned that down? That, that is not accurate, Senator. Uh, assets are requested. There's a process that is made. Um, and How many requests did the, did the Trump team or the Trump detail ask for? Uh, I can get you that number in a queue for you, you don't now, You don't know now. So I can speak to the ones that reported in the Washington Post, and we can go through them if you like. But you don't know how many, how many requests there were. In general, how many requests since 2021 that the former Trump detail has made a request for assets? You've had two weeks. You had a spokesperson put something out that is false on its face. By the way, did you approve this statement when it went out? Uh, I, I don't know if I did or didn't, Senator. Has this I, spokesperson, is, is he still employed? Does he, he still have a job? He is still employed, Senator. So he lied on behalf of the Secret Service. He still has a job. Did your predecessor, the former director, does she approve this statement? Senator, uh, our comms team, they, they send out statements. Uh, they do deconflict them and they put them out. Did she approve this statement? Uh, I don't know if she did or did not. Senator. And you don't know if you did either? Uh, I don't recall re approving it, Senator. 
Will you commit to provide this committee in writing every written request for additional resources from the Trump campaign or the Trump detail and every response from Secret Service? Senator, I will commit to providing responses and getting you the information that you are seeking. Let me ask you something. Uh, and, and who makes the decision to deny those requests? Did you make that decision? Which requests? Are you talking about the ones that were in the Any Washington of Post? Yes. So the process, sir, is that uh, a detail uh, will make a request for either staffing, technical assets uh, that is handled between uh, the field office and the detail. It goes up to a logistics office uh, between our Okay, so there's a bureaucracy. Is there a decision maker? It's not a bureaucracy, it, Senator. Give me the it's person a that's a decision maker. Is there one? Uh, Senator, uh, it's a conversation. It's not just an absolute yay but, or so, nay. So let me tell you what I believe. I believe that the Secret Service leadership made a political decision to deny these requests. And I think the Biden administration has been suffused with partisan politics. Did the same person who denied the request for additional security to President Trump also repeatedly deny the request for security to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., whose father was murdered by an assassin and whose uncle was murdered by an assassin. Did the same person make that decision? Senator, what I will tell you is that Secret Service agents are not political. Okay, you're not answering my question. But, but you know what? Leadership I'll get to your appointed answer, by the Senator, president, if leadership you allow me appointed to. by the president is political. I have a simple question, yes or no. Did the same person deny the Trump request that also denied the RFK request? That's a yes or no question. Uh, Senator, that is not a yes or no question. One, there is a process for a candidate nominee to receive protection. Is there, that does the is buck a stop bicameral, anywhere? Does that is the a buck bicameral, stop bipartisan anywhere? process so, that the Hill participates It's a bicameral, bipartisan process. What camera? For a candidate, you, you for are a not candidate a Congress. You don't have a camera. Mr. Kennedy submitted a request that was referred over to the CPAC. Okay, you're refusing to answer the question. Let me ask, because the failures on that day were catastrophic. By the way, is it true that on the day of the, of the Butler event that Secret Service transferred agent from President Trump to the First Lady? Uh, no, sir, that's not true. That's been widely reported. Uh, it's not true. There was one airport agent that actually went on the manpower request for the Trump detail. They handled the arrival at the airport what for is the First the Lady. What was the relative the size of the Trump detail compared to the detail that is assigned to the President of the First Lady? Uh, Senator, the former president travels with a full shift, just what, like the president. What's the re so the exact same size? Is that your testimony, that, that the, President Trump had the same size detail that President Biden has? On the day of in Butler, the agents surrounding him, it is the same number of agents surrounding the president today. There is a difference between a sitting president who also not only... Hold, hold on, you're using president in a way that is not clear. Is it your testimony that in Butler, Pennsylvania... Donald Trump had the same number of agents protecting him that Joe Biden has at a comparable event. I'm telling you the shift, the close protection shift surrounding. That's, That's yes what you no. asked me, Senator, and I'm trying to answer it. You, you are not answering it. Is it the same number of agents or not? Senator, there is a difference between the sitting president of the United States. Then what's the difference? The difference? 2X, 3X, 5X, National 10X. command authority to launch a nuclear strike, sir. I, I, I'm, there I'm are not other asking. assets How many that more travel agents? with the president that sir, the former president sir, will not get. Sir, you are refusing to but answer But the number straight. of Secret Service sir, agents stop protecting you. him. Stop interrupting me. Go ahead, you Senator. You are refusing to answer clear and direct questions. I am asking the relative difference in the number of agents between those assigned to Donald Trump and those assigned to Joe Biden. I'm not asking why you assign more to Joe Biden. I'm asking, is the difference, is it 2X? Is it 3X? Is it 5X? Is it 10X? Senator, I will get you that number so you can see it with your own eyes. Is there any doubt in your mind or in the collective mind of the FBI that President Trump was shot in the ear by a bullet fired by the assassin crooks. There is, Senator, there is absolutely no doubt in the FBI's mind it, it whether uh, former President Trump was uh, hit with, the, okay. with a bullet and wounded in the ear. No doubt there never has been. Okay. I've been part of this investigation since the very beginning, and that has never been raised. You're sure? Yes. It wasn't a space laser. No. It wasn't a murder hornet. 
Absolutely not. It wasn't Sasquatch. No, Senator. It was a bullet. It was a bullet, Senator. 100%. Fired by crooks. Yes, sir. That hit President Trump in the ear and almost killed him. 100 percent, Senator. Okay. Glad we cleared that up. And I want to uh, thank uh, our witnesses uh, for your testimony here today. Uh, certainly what happened on January, or excuse me, July, July 13th uh, could and uh, should have been uh, prevented from what I have heard today. Uh, I'm certainly grateful to our witnesses uh, for their candid answers and for helping to provide additional clarity and new information about the, uh, the circumstances uh, surrounding uh, this attack. Acting uh, Director Rowe, uh, some of what you have said today uh, conflicts uh, with information and accounts that we have received from local law enforcement that we've had the opportunity to talk with. Uh, they have uh, been voluntarily and I will say expeditiously uh, cooperating uh, with our bipartisan uh, investigation, which we certainly appreciate. But we now need to speak with Secret Service uh, agents directly, who are directly involved. And I would uh, say that you need to uh, make them available as uh, soon as possible. Those, those interviews can't start weeks from now or months from now. Uh, time is of uh, the essence when memories are fresh and you can get the information that is uh, most important uh, to us. So my question for you as we uh, wrap up this hearing, uh, Actor Director Rowe, will you uh, commit to having those agents available for this committee to interview as soon as possible in a matter of days, not weeks, matter of days. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you.